Welcome to Alpha Coding Podcast, an all-access pass to medical coding and billing pro tips that help you start your week off smarter. And now, here is your host, Tony L. Holmes. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Alpha Coding Podcast series. I am your host, Tony L. Holmes. Welcome to episode 44 of the podcast. Today is November 2nd. Welcome to a brand new month. And here we are about to close up 2020. I don't think there's anybody on this planet that is sad to see 2020 go. So you're in for a treat with today's episode because I invited a special guest to join us. He's a well-known figure in the HIM and RCM world. So it's going to be great. We're going to be talking about facilitating effective physician queries. So before we dive into our topic, it's time for your Monday dose of positivity, the Mindset Monday tip. And it's brought to you by Contempo Coding, which is an on-demand educational resource provider created for coders by coders. They specialize in affordable coding certification prep courses to help you accelerate in your career. Right now, they're offering an exclusive special to Alpha Coding podcast listeners, and that's $125 off the Certified Risk Adjustment Coding Prep Course. This prep course has a 100% pass rate and includes some great bonus content when you order through our affiliate website. Visit Visit our website, alphacodingexperts.com, and head over to the Deals and Discounts tab for a link to take advantage of this absolute steal of a deal. So our Mindset Monday tip is all about managing self-sabotaging behavior. The quote I want to share with you says, be prepared each day to confront your own self-sabotage. And I think this quote has a lot of power because your mind can be your greatest asset or it can be your worst enemy. You really have to control that inner dialogue. If your subconscious mind is planning these negative messages and limiting beliefs, it's going to hold you back and have systemic consequences in your your life. Your inner dialogue influences the intensity of self-sabotaging behaviors. We all struggle with self-sabotaging behaviors, sometimes consciously, a lot of times subconsciously. So you really want to be mindful of that because that will influence your self-sabotaging behaviors. So our guest for today is Glenn Krauss with Core CDI and Top Gun Audit School. Glenn is based out of Burlington, Vermont, and is a healthcare subject matter expert, published author, frequent guest on industry podcasts, speaker, and hosts the Wiser Wednesday podcast series. Definitely check that podcast series out. I invited him on the show today to discuss his best pro tips for facilitating effective physician queries. So thank you for joining us today, Glenn. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm glad I'm, uh, you, you invited me to the podcast. Absolutely. So walk us through the model scenario for facilitating the physician query process from start to finish. Oh, absolutely. The query process has been around for years, as we know. The missing piece or the secret sauce for facilitating the physician query process from start to finish is to view queries as a ta- opportunity to educate physicians on why the query is being issued and also include a teaching moment or a teaching point in the query, okay? So we should be thinking about how do we avoid the query? How do we get ahead of the query? Because queries, to me, is a measure of a defect in the documentation. That's why we're asking a physician a query. So I have a great case study, very briefly, of a colleague of mine who asked me how to approach this physician who responded to the query but didn't ask the question. And we know we have that often, many a time. And it goes back to function and form. And the piece that was really missing from that particular query was, okay, what's in it for the physician, number one? What's in it for the patient? And to leave that physician with a teaching point so they can avoid the similar query. That's what I call facilitating a physician query process with the goal of driving down the number of queries. And by the way, the revised query was sent to the physician and he was so pleased, he even thanked my colleague who works in compliance and compliance audit uh, in education. Uh, He recognized that, hey, I I certainly left something out that was really important from my patient's perspective and my uh, patient's potential financial responsibility for a couple of tests he ordered in a patient that was suspected to be uh, exposed to COVID. And so we now we have a query that actually educated the physician and also made the physician uh, 
uh, happy, he actually thanked the, 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 my colleague for issuing a second query. That's a model scenario for, take, for making sure that we're educating our physicians on how to avoid a query. It doesn't have to be 30 sentences. One sentence is enough to make a key point the doctor can use in his practice of medicine. So that's really what I'm thinking is a model scenario. It's not to think of a series scenario, uh, a uh, query as a repetitive process as an integral part. We should be getting out in front of query. Educate, try to avoid them. What strategies can I employ as a CDI professional to avoid asking for heart failure 20 times a day? The code's been out for what, Tony? How far long? The code's been out for what, 12 years? We're still <laughs> asking physicians for the type of heart failure. It's ridiculous. That's true, Glenn. The same ones over and over. But I love your point about getting ahead of it uh -huh. and being proactive instead of reactive. That's, That's right. a great Absolutely. perspective. Excellent. So what makes a physician query effective? What's the secret sauce? Oh, I think I alluded to that, but I can kind of uh, reinforce that. Is to understand, I and uh, first of all, I want to say what makes a query effective is recognizing it as, it as one of the many tools we have uh, in our arsenal to drive documentation integrity. Uh, that's important. That's really the number one piece I want to say right on that. Is that what, what else is an effective query? I mentioned teaching point. Leave the provider with a teaching point that they can consider next time, as I did with this case. The third point about a qu effective query is to uh, recognize good documentation when you see it. Okay, this patient's particular case, I looked at the HPI and the documentation, and I wanted to kiss the, the screen, not literally, but figuratively, because <laughs> the, the HPI was wonderful. It had four elements. It told the patient's story. I, it described and told why the patient needs to be seen. What did the patient say? That's key to medical necessity right off the bat for the doctor's e &M, was seeing the patient and for the level and frequency of seeing a patient. And one, well, the third thing really is, as I can, I'm going to allude to here, is an effective query recognizes and gives a doctor credit for the good pieces of the documentation. So I started off this query by saying, Dr. So-and-so, great documentation in your HPI. I wish other physicians would follow the same approach. Now tell me, that's a way to give the doctor a pat on the back that truly has meaning. It's not trying to patronize. Any, you know, one of the things that uh, from a query process is, as I mentioned, give them credit for what's good in the chart because physicians never or very infrequently get positive feedback. Tony, they, you always get a note about what they did wrong. How about recognizing what they did right? That's a way to earn the trust and respect. And the last thing is, if what makes a query effective is not, is the mentality of trying to educate and drive, reduce the queries. And I think the last thing I certainly want to encourage is, uh, you know, there's always a time when you can pick up a chart and identify insufficiency or clarification needs. I, as a practicing CDI, ask myself this question, and it should be in the repertoire of everyone else. Is it going to make a difference? And I don't mean just reimbursement. Is that something that's better suited for me discussing on a quick call or passing in the hospital if I'm still working or in an educational session with the, with the group or the individual or the section unit at their monthly meeting? Or do, can, it, can it wait then? Or do I really need it now? Because we really want to save the queries for when they're, they're beneficial, when they're truly going to impact. It's like that old fable. Uh, you remember this fable? Uh, the guy gets, the kid gets lonely at home. He calls the fire department and the fire department rushes over there and there's no fire. So they tell him, don't do that again. <laughs> remember this one? Two days later, he does the same yeah. thing. Finally, <laughs> when his house is on fire, the, the fire department don't come. Well, we, we should have the same thought processes. Do I really need to issue this query or can it wait for an educational piece or can I develop a resource, a tip sheet? Because I can tell you, Physicians are over queried. They're overburdened. There was a piece in the, uh, one of the magazines uh, I'm going to post on LinkedIn where it says physicians spend an hour, a minimum of an hour, every day just waiting through their email. 
from patients, from oh labs, and we, you know, getting urgent requests for lab values, abnormal lab values, patient questions. Think about CDI queries. We're jump, we're, we're gumming up the box with queries. Let's not do that. Let's only use the ones that we know the doctor is going to have an impact. So I, I think that should all be an underlying theme of queries. Definitely. So you you definitely touched on this, but tell us what makes a physician query ineffective. Um, obviously, a an effective query is one that's not that can wait, uh, that can be used as an educational piece. Use that case study as an educational piece. Or ineffective if a doctor hasn't answered the query, or just like this physician who answered the query but did not answer the query, address the question. Well, that's an ineffective query, and that really turns off uh, physicians. I can tell you, you want to you want to really rub physicians the wrong way issue queries that are ineffective. So ineffective to me means, is it really necessary? Can it wait? Number two, before you send the query, read the query to see if it makes sense. Put it down for a minute uh, after you type it and look at it and see would, it, would an outside physician understand it within a minute of reading the first sentence or two, what am I asking? Could you be surprised how many queries I review as part of my CDI review process? And I'm looking at the query and saying, this could have been done a better way, or this could have waited. They missed the point of asking the right query. They asked the query, uh, but they missed their larger component of what should have been in there. So now we have to read a query. So any query that misses the boat is ineffective because now we have to go back nine times out of 10. Coding gets the gets the entire chart and has to requery. That's not an effective process, is it? No, it's not. And do, I think those see, are great examples. Do you see that in your practice as well? Absolutely, all the time. We talked about this on on Wiser Wednesday, right? The the sniff test. And yeah. There's such an issue with query overload. And, you, and, I'm, and I think you you know we have an issue of trying to query just to get our KPIs of 30% query rate, which means to me that we have a 30% defect rate. Is that is that a measure of success? On CDI, I think we know the answer to that. Our query rate should be going down to three or four percent. That, to me, is a measure of the KPI because we've done our homework and we've engaged physicians uh, as willing participants, not targets of queries. Definitely. So that segues into our next uh, question. Uh -huh. There's a serious problem with query overloads and the quality of queries issued. Why do you think this is happening, and what can we do about it? The fundamental problem in the industry. Well, I can, I want to call it a, funda a fundamental opportunity that we as a, a profession should be taking advantage of is a recognizing the KPIs, addressing the query overload by un understanding the physician's specific needs and pain points and challenges and documentation, and then overlaying uh, the diagnosis, importance of diagnosis in a concerted planned effort to reduce queries. For instance, let me give you an example, uh, heart failure. We talked about heart failure asking for acute on chronic, acute on chronic systolic. And so one of my colleagues about six months ago said, I'm sick of leaving these queries. I'm getting query fatigue. And I say, well, what have you done? What's your number one query? Uh, of course, they said heart failure, not surprising. So I said to the, uh, my colleague, oh, what approach are you using? I'm leaving queries all the time. Doctors not responding or checking off unable to determine or not clinically significant. So that's the easy way out. So I, my, my, she said, what should I do? I said, uh, let me give you, let's do some role playing and then you can come to your answer to that question. So I said, pretend you're Dr. So-and-so. And this is how CDI should be thinking. I said, pretend you're a Dr. So-and-so and I'm going to be the CDI and I'm going to ask you a few questions. Okay, Dr. So-and-so, can I have two minutes? Something that can save you from reduction of queries. Oh, heck yes. Tell me what I need to do. That's the physician's favorite line. Just tell me what to write. Can't do that. So I said to the, my colleague as a physician, Dr. Physician Susie, I said, Dr. Susie, uh, let me ask you a quick question. Uh, would you admit a patient with a stable chronic condition? And she looked at me. Uh, I was actually was on the phone, but her, her voice was, uh, I heard her say, no, I certainly wouldn't. 
And I said, well, that's exactly what you're doing when you put down heart failure. Because when you send the code in, your code or you check off heart failure, it says chronic stable because it has no specificity. If you build a level three E&M or critical care, you can rest assured your chart will be reviewed for prepayment and they'll likely they'll like you, likely uh, downcode your E&M because you don't have the complexity of medical decision making, the mounting complexity of data correlating with the uh, severity of the patient's illness, number of diagnosis and management options. And, and she said, well, I never knew about that. Uh, can you tell me more about this E&M and the complexity of medical decision-making and number of diagnoses? So now I have engaged the physician in the question, and now I have the opportunity to provide information to avoid that. You see where I'm coming from? So I'm using it as an area to identify doctors on um, uh, knowledge deficit and being able to have that skill set to schedule a time so I can help him or her with the documentation and intertwine that with the requirement for acuity, cause and effect relationship, clinical specificity and type. So I'm not just trying to focus on the acuity and the clinical and the type. I want to focus on the entire documentation to help the physician become better at clinical documentation integrity for his practice and the patient's welfare. Does that make sense? Lynn, that's a, an excellent answer. And I really like what you said about, hey, doc, you got just two minutes. I'm going to save you a lot of time. That's yeah, the way to get them in. That's right. And I can say, if you, are, can, if you can show a physician how to become more effective in a history and physical, which happens to be like nine or 10 pages nowadays, it only needs to be two or three pages, or a progress note 20 pages, they can winnow it down and spend one quarter of the time charting and spend more time doctoring in front of the patient. So I always say, if I can show you a strategy to document more effectively, reduce the number of queries, work smarter, not harder, doctor in front of the patient, not in front of the computer, can I schedule a few minutes with you? I have never had a doctor tell me to go jump in a lake. That's right. Glenn, we're, we're all human. We're all, you know, we make mistakes. So what do you do when you issue a query or make some type of error when a query should not have been issued? How do you handle that? Well, first of all, it's a good question. First of all, I don't want to call it a mistake. I call it a I call it an oversight because mistake means it implies you did it purposely, okay? I learned that from the... Uh I don't know if you remember as a child, your mother would say, don't do that, you made a mistake. I say, no, it's an oversight. It sounds better. But in any case, you know, an oversight is you issue the query. I don't have a problem. I'm human too. I may have an issue the query in the past. I know I have. That may, have, may, may not have been relevant now that I think about it when I got a response or I didn't get an answer. I go back to the physician and I say, hey, sorry for that query. It was an oversight on my part. Here's what I was thinking. I'll uh, work hard to avoid avoid these. So to me, it's admitting that you uh, had an oversight and what are you going to do to avoid it? Because I can tell you just avoiding the situation and hoping the doctor doesn't see the query or doesn't get uh, PO'd or, or really disturbed. No, I take the initiative to run because physicians understand they're not perfect either. Uh, and they, they and to and to potentially jeopardize your working relationship and respect with the physician because you had a query that was an oversight. That's that's not something I'm going to allow myself to happen. I like the change from mistake to oversight. That's a, a really great perspective. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, what do you say to the frustrated doctor that's burnt out, jaded, doesn't want to deal with queries, doesn't want to want to respond to queries, doesn't see the value in CDI? What do you say to well, them? The, the first and foremost, when I see a doctor that doesn't respond to queries, it tells me right off the bat and with 99% certainty that the physician doesn't know what's in it for them. And one of my colleagues, Dr. Tisha Titus, she's uh, affiliated with the residency program at uh, Emory down in Atlanta. I asked her that question about two weeks ago when I was out on my, in, on my walk uh, every evening to enjoy the, the, the uh, fall weather. She said, they could, why, when I said to her, okay, you work a lot with residents and teachings and education. Why is it that a lot of them don't answer the queries? And she said, with no uncertainty, unequivocally, because we're focusing on the hospital primarily with our queries, and physicians don't understand. They, they want something out of the answering the queries. They want to know what's in it for me. It's that favorite radio station, WIIFM out of Atlanta, okay? So if you have a, uh, it gives, that gives me an opportunity to say, 
okay, if they're not responding to queries, let me find out why they're not responding. Uh, be polite, be fact-finding, be sincere. Hey, doctor, I'll notice that you're not answering any queries or stop answering. This the lack of specificity does impact a fully informed, coordinated, coordinated care. If you call, if you order a consult and the next, and let's say you order a cardiology consult, uh, and you don't have this provisional diagnosis that you obviously are thinking, that's why you're asking the cardiologist for their thoughts and opinions. That puts the cardiologist as a handicap because he doesn't know what you're thinking. Why am I ordering it? I think this pulmonary edema could be related to a uh, cardiac uh, a malignancy, or it's related, uh, it's related to the patient having high house and two pulmonary edema. They were hiking up a 6,000 uh, foot mountain last week, or, I, or it, may be, it may be that they have right side of the heart failure, okay, back up into the lung, or they may have uh, the sequela of a pulmonary embolism that you with small showers of, of uh, emboli, okay? If you don't put this down, the doctor cardiologist doesn't actually understand what my what are my doctor concerned so who suffers the patient and i take that personally because my mother was in the hospital about six months ago and that's exactly what the consultant cardiologist told my father i don't understand why i'm ordering it because my father was there so when it really hits home when it affects you personally or your family and so is the doctor burnt out the doctors are burnt out what can we do to alleviate the queries as i stated earlier and let's let's take our program and, and see what we can do to reduce the queries. Become physician champions. Let the physicians know we're on their side. We want. We don't want to issue queries. What can I do to help you understand the, uh, how the queries impacts your uh, your business of medicine and the patient's care? That's the piece, Tony. That's really missing. That most programs don't address. Getting ahead of the query is my common theme. That's a, a great takeaway, Glenn. So, what are your top three pro tips for? CDI professionals to facilitate effective queries. Okay, well, uh, I think we touched base on some of these, but an effective query is a query that you that you want to issue that you structure with an educational piece. So the you're, you're trying to avoid asking a query next time because repetitive queries means we're not doing a good job of educating our physicians. And I call it teachings and learnings, not necessarily education. Sharing best practices of documentation and sharing learnings of the best practices of documentation that support the diagnosis to avoid these validation denials and medical necessity. The next thing I would say is, uh, uh, just to reinforce earlier, effective query is having the mindset of getting ahead of the, getting ahead of the query. How can I avoid them? What strategies can I use to speak with physicians? Or if I can't, if I'm not working in the hospital, what strategies can I use to get ahead of the queries, whether it be tip sheets, resources, podcasts? You know, I, I'm a firm believer in five to 10 minute podcasts to make your point across so I can avoid these queries. And, you know, you may, and I've used the, the process of saying, how many of you on the podcast have, have received a query for heart failure? Let me, let me demonstrate and explain how you can avoid those in the first place. That would get the people's attention. Okay, and the last thing is effective queries is, okay, as I mentioned earlier, facilitate effective queries. Effective means uh, that it's necessary, it's structured properly, it recognizes the doctor's strong points that I found in the chart, which I acknowledge, and getting right to the point and leaving that position with a teaching point or making sure there's something the physician sees that benefits him or her and her patient. Like the example I put in the, uh, in my earlier about that person with the COVID-19, I said, a standard of documentation is for the assessment in the medicals and the assessment and the plan of care to be congruent with each other. This ensures that uh, that any test or diagnostic workup or treatments ordered uh, will be considered a covered benefit on behalf of the patient and the patient will alleviate any of the unnecessary financial burdens that were related to insufficient documentation. And I, I, I was more direct than that, but this is what I'm trying to say. Help me help you help your patient. 
And I think that's why the physician responded back to my colleague because there was something in it for the doctor and there was something in it for the patient. And there's one thing that gets physicians' attention. It's their responsibility and their taking care of the patient's needs. And that includes financial repercussions. So that's my long-winded answer to my three pro tips. Those are excellent pro tips, Glenn. So what's next for you? Well, a couple of things I want to just uh, leave the, the audience with is, one, you know, I have a lot of podcasts, Wise on Wednesdays. I have a lot of LinkedIn posts and uh, been speaking to a lot of the HEMA chapters. A couple of things that are coming up I think that people should know about is one, just to reiterate, CDI, there's a better way. Uh, it, we need to be doing a lot more than just querying physicians. We need to be thinking, how do we transform CDI to a powerful force? And and how do we do that? We take the initiative to see how we can improve our processes. They ask physicians, well, how can we help you in your in your challenges of documentation? The next thing I want to say is, speaking of that, my colleague Heidi Hillstrom and Elaine Maldana, Maldana and Otto, uh, we're creating a what's called a, a Van CDI workshop in January called Turbo CDI. So those who want to really catapult their uh, their knowledge of effective strategies for CDI and become very proficient at, uh, with skill sets and core competencies and the standards of documentation, how to apply them, how to transform your program and your approach. You may want to consider that. Uh, we're going to have an announcement at topgunauditschool.com. And the last thing is that, you know, I've been working for the last year on developing some software solution that's not focused primarily on, on capturing CCs and MCCs. It's actually a web-based uh, intuitive tool uh, that actually guides you through when you do your chart review in systematic fashion what things are important to look for. What if you don't have these elements that are included in the uh, guidance and the solution, uh, it directs you to what to do about it. So it's really to me a tool or a CDI solution that's not a crutch, not just focused only on getting the diagnosis that half the time get refuted by the payer and you don't get paid for the, the diagnosis or the work you perform. And it's designed to break down barriers and silos of CDI, physician advisor, case manager, and you are, because after all, CDI cannot do it alone. We must have a team approach. So my, my last point is, if you're still working in the silos of CDI and queries, you must, it's urgent to break down these silos and work together. And I have a couple of actually webinars on the Top Gun Audit School that tell you, give you some guidance on how to do that. It's not as hard as you think, and I encourage you to check it out. So that's what's next for me, among many things in my in my quest for seven day a week CDI. That's awesome, Glenn. I can't wait to see what's ahead for you. And I really appreciate you joining us today. You've given our audience so many great golden nuggets. So thank you so oh, much. Thank you very much, Tom. I appreciate it. Uh, good luck on your CDI endeavors, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join us today, Glenn. Be sure to connect with Glenn Kraus on LinkedIn. So it's time for this week's coding pro tip, and it's brought to you by Project Resume. When is the last time you had your resume updated? Your resume is literally your entry ticket to that next great opportunity. Project Resume will design a customized ATS-friendly resume to demonstrate your unique skills and experience. And even better, it's written by coders for coders. Make that investment in yourself today and visit at projectresume.net and mention my code alpha coding for special pricing. If you have a coding related question and would like to be featured in one of our coding pro tips, please reach out to me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. So this week's coding pro tip comes to us from Maryland. Hi, Tony. We keep receiving coding denials for same level cervical corpectomies that are performed with anterior cervical spinal fusions. Can you help us? Well, yes, I can definitely help you, but unfortunately, this is a lot more complex than what a quick answer on my podcast is going to be able to do. So I'm happy to give you some general advice, but I definitely recommend consulting an expert. You're welcome to contact our firm. We do specialize in spine and neurosurgery coding. So this is a complex issue. Most of the time, it comes down to documentation in the operative report. So there is a coding rule specific to same-level cervical corpectomies performed with 
anterior cervical spinal fusions. The thing is that the clinical documentation has to state that over 50% of the cervical spine was extracted in order to justify billing the corpectomy at the same level as the fusion. So if that documentation is not present, then the corpectomy is not separately reportable. I'm happy to take a deeper dive into these coding denials. If you want to contact us, be sure to do so. Please remember to hit that subscribe button now so you never miss another episode. Also, be sure to drop us a rating and review on iTunes. We really appreciate your support. So this concludes today's episode. Until next week, thank you for listening to the Alpha Coding Podcast. We'll see you next Monday. For more information about medical coding and billing pro tips, including how to hire alpha coding experts, follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, or visit our website at www.alphacodingexperts.com. Thank you.